Yeah. Good morning, everyone. I'm Kimberly to Persia. This is the Holidays Podcast. It is January 17th, 2003, a Tuesday morning after a long, long weekend. Woo! Yeah, so we're, we switched the countdown this morning, as some of you might have noticed, uh, to five minutes as opposed to ten. And I was like, I could do this. And then Alex is like screaming at me, you have a minute left. And I'm like still in the bathroom, like finishing my makeup. And I'm like, ah! So, yeah, I'll be much better tomorrow. Anyway. Yeah. So, so welcome, everyone. Hope you had a great, great weekend. Um, yeah. Today, I didn't even preload the National Todays. What? What? Man, this is failing today. All right. Um, our special holiday of today is National Hot Buttered Rum Day. Yeah. So I don't, I don't have hot buttered rum, but I have the butterbeer mug from Harry Potter Land in Harry Potter World at Universal, which I absolutely love. And I love butterbeer. Oh my gosh. I'm not sure. I think I like it best hot. And then I like it frozen. And then I like it like the the carbonated kind, like the just regular. I think that's my order of preference. So if you let me know what you think about the Harry Potter butter beer, what 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 format you like it best. They also have it like in fudge. The ice cream is also really good too. There's many ways that you can enjoy the butter beer. But then I also have a shot of just hot butter. <laughs> so I don't have the butter rum, but I got the butter beer mug and I got hot butter. So I think that counts. That counts, right? That counts for something. Counts for something. Um, let's learn about National Hot Buttered Rum Day. All right. It's hot. It's buttered. It's hot buttered rum. Haven't had it? No worries. Today is National Hot Buttered Rum Day, and it's the perfect opportunity to give it a try. Hot buttered rum is a mixed drink containing rum, butter, hot water or cider, sweetener, and spices such as cinnamon, nutmeg, and cloves. Oh, that sounds amazing. It dates back to colonial America, but likely originates from Europe. It's most often enjoyed in the fall and winter. Well, yeah, because it's cold and cozy. And it's been described as a comfort food in a mug. Craving a warm mug of it already? We are too. And oh my God, that looks amazing. What? Find yourself some hot buttered rum. That looks delish. So good. Oh, anyway. Woo. We've got, we've got a great show for you today. We've got a couple of really fun sketches. Um, but let's, and we will get to them as we go throughout our sketches. So first we have, second we have after our hot buttered rum feature, we have Benjamin Franklin Day. Benjamin Franklin Day. Now, I don't know if anyone else, does anyone else remember there was this game and it was called like Penny. It was this computer game like in the 90s. And you played as like this girl named Penny and it was like back in the future, back in the past. And she had a dog and there was Benjamin Franklin there. And like you went through and it was like an interactive thing. Does anyone remember that? I loved that game. I did not own that game. I had a friend of mine that owned that game and I would go over to her house and play that all the time. I was like that friend that was like, I'm going to your house to play your game. <laughs> but I loved that game. And it was like Penny something. And it was really cool. And it had Benjamin Franklin in it. And he was like the best like character. Um, anyway, but that's 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 my first reg like impressions of Benjamin Franklin was playing this like video game when I was a kid. But anywho, let's dive back into Benjamin Franklin Day. Page tribute to one of the Greatest founding fathers of the U.S. on the anniversary of his birth. <laughs> For those of you who don't know how big of a deal he was, just take a look at $100 bills, commonly known as Benjamins. Yeah. The number of hats Benjamin Franklin wore is mind-boggling, with inventor, author, printer, politician, musician, diplomat, and scientist being but a few. He was a renaissance man after the renaissance. Yeah. So join us as we dive into the life of this polymath, someone who is an expert in many different subject areas, 
He was a man of many exceptional talents, and that fact alone is worth celebrating. <laughs> yeah. So he had many contributions to science, right? He uh, contributed to the field of electricity. We talked about him a couple of days ago with the kites, the most notable one being the invention of the lightning rod in 1752. He also coined common terms related to electronics, such as battery, charge, conductor, and electrify. Ooh. In the 1740s, his scientific pamphlets helped found the American Philosophical Society, the first of its kind in the colonies. He also invented bifocals and the Franklin stove. In 1731, Franklin founded the first subscription library, the Library Company of Philadelphia. In 1741, his pamphlet on the need to educate youth in Pennsylvania resulted in the founding of the modern-day University of Pennsylvania, which remains one of the top schools in the country. And in 1757, he began to serve as a representative for Pennsylvania. And by the 1770s, he became the first American ambassador to France. He was also part of the Committee of Five who were responsible for drafting and signing the Declaration of Independence. Ooh. Another feather to his cap was becoming the first postmaster general of the United States. And he was put on the U.S. postage stamp after his birth. So it really kind of feels like Benjamin Franklin just made a lot of things possible. He was like, hmm, how about this? And they're like, that's a great idea. Like, how about education? Yeah, that's a great idea, Benjamin Franklin. How about post offices? Okay, that's a great idea. Uh, how about electricity? And they're like, that's the best idea. Yeah. So so Benjamin Franklin was, he wore many, many, many hats. And, um, and, he, prob and he wore probably real hats too in the day because he wasn't he kind of like balding, at least most of his life. Anyway, so yay, Benjamin Franklin. Without you, we might not have electricity. Although there are rumors that electricity, there were a lot of other people that were invented or discovering electricity around the time. But for America, he's our founding father of that electricity. Yeah, and for that, thank you. Ooh. Next, we have Cable Car Day. Ooh, Cable Car. All right. Um, the day celebrates Andrew Smith Halliday getting the patent for the cable car in 1871. It's believed that Halliday saw horses struggle to pull cars up the steep hills of San Francisco. Oh, yeah. Like they got those really hard hills in San Francisco. Those poor, those poor, poor. Oh, he was poor, poor horses. And he worried about the news of people falling and dying. Wow. He decided to invent a system where strong cables would move the cars up and down the hill. Today, San Francisco is the last American city to still run any true cable cars. The cable car musician in San Francisco is also a tourist attraction. In other American cities, you will find electric streetcars. Cool. Wow, that's fantastic. Um... I love how their example on this page is not the the San Francisco <laughs> trolley, but just like some ski lift. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't, I've, I don't think I've been in one of these like ski lift things, but I have been in the things in Walt Disney, the little like cable cars that take you from like one thing to another. Not recently, but uh, very long for a while ago. But they, you know, they kind of float along and they go to Epcot sometime. I don't know where they come from. But they go to Epcot for sure. So there's something. I don't know where they go. I haven't been on them for a while. But you can definitely ride these things at Disney. Yeah. 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 Cool. All right. Cable car. So ride yourself a cable car today. Oh, next we have customer service day. And we have a sketch for you. Yes. So this sketch was written by... Amanda Fisher, and it uh, and starring myself and Jennifer Callison. So here we go. <laughs> Wait, what's wrong? <laughs> A lady in there just asked to speak to the manager. Why? An item that we don't sell isn't available for purchase. What item? An air fryer. Does she know this is a Barnes and Noble? I don't know. All I know is that she yelled at me. She called me stupid. She asked me what my purpose in life was if I couldn't find this item for her. And then she asked to speak to a manager. 
<laughs> it's like National Customer Service Day. You're allowed to treat the customer any way you like. You're not afraid we're gonna lose a customer? <laughs> then go in there and tell them how you really feel. Fuck you, you fucking... Yeah. We literally did shoot that outside of Barnes and Noble. So we just shot it outside. Yeah. And uh, yeah, it was really fun. So shout out to all the customer service people. I've, I've worked as customer service in the past and it is hard. It is challenging. You get people that come in and I, but I've also been that lady too. Uh, it, like when you work in customer service, you recognize when customer service is not good and it drives you crazy. But anyway, shout out to all the amazing people that are dealing with customers on this day. And Try to be a little nicer. All right, let's 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 dive in and learn a little bit about that, which is probably going to say the same thing. <laughs> customer service day. No brand can exist without a customer, and every service and good is created keeping the customer in mind. When so much focus is on the consumer alone, and understandably so, we tend to forget that the customer service department has a huge role to play in ensuring that the customer gets the best of service and that their complaints are heeded if the needs arise. For many brands, customer service has been made available around the clock so that a customer may seek help whenever they might need it. To create brand loyalty, businesses need to make sure that they have a quick and efficient customer service team. Oh, so it's kind of really not like for the customer service people to be like, they have a hard time. It's just kind of like, yay, let's celebrate it. <laughs> so, <laughs> wow. It's kind of a bummy, a bummy one. For people that work in customer service, because it's just like, let's recognize them, but you know, whatever. <laughs> oh, this is an interesting graphic. Oh, ditch New Year's resolutions day. All right. So this is like if you were trying, trying in the past, you know, to keep your New Year's resolution, this is the day that you can say, eh, screw it. Grab some ice cream, skip that workout, and spend more time on your cell phone on Ditch New Year's Resolutions Day on January 17th. If all your grand resolutions for the year have started to seem unrealistic or more of a chore than an actual commitment, then today is your guilt-free opportunity to scrap these resolutions and run for the hills! Yeah! Yeah. You know, if at first you don't succeed, I guess give up. I don't believe in that, but... You know, I guess, you know, some people like to feel supported in their in their failure. And, and, you know, honestly, some people do set, you can set some, like, really unrealistic New Year's resolutions. So make sure you choose achievable goals. If you've ever used the guideline SMART goals, so it's like, there's like, it's all an acronym. But it's basically something that you can measure that is actually achievable, that you have a specific time frame. It's very specific. Um, yeah. And, 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 and uh, yeah. So... And, and it's something that you also are enthused about as well. So you got to make sure you like put those into your goals. Otherwise, it's going to be really hard to achieve them. But hey, if you ditch your New Year's resolution today, you can do a new one. That's what I have to say. If you, if you ditch that New Year's resolution and you're like, this one isn't working, you can always do a new one. And then you have a new New, Year's, new, new Year's resolution. <laughs> oh, next one. International We Are Not Broken Day. Oh, that's very dramatic. The day creates awareness that despite the fact that about the fact that despite what society thinks of individuals with a history of physical and emotional trauma, mental illness, amputations or disorders that seem invisible, they are human beings and our neighbors. The word broken indicates something that is not working. So trauma and disease, however, should not define who or what we are. Yeah, exactly. But if we give into this broken tab tag, it can easily lead to depression, isolation and misplaced guilt. International We Are Not Broken Day seems to seeks to put an end to the cycle, challenging societal norms. Great. So let's see. Was there a history of this at all? When this uh, um, uh, an organization called We Are Not Broken has been established to correct the misconceptions, um, thus instituting the in International We Are Not Broken Day in 2019. Okay. So yeah. So that's the thing. Yeah, you were not defined by just a couple things that might have happened to you, even though they are very traumatic you can move on and you can be a whole person so yeah sending hugs to everyone out there we are not broken 
You Are Not Broken. Yeah. It's a very good, meaningful one. James Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. Oh, that's a name. That's a long name. James Leonard Taggle Gordon. Try saying that uh, five times fast. James T- Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. James Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. James Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. James Taggle Gordon Day. Yeah. Uh, James Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. James Leonard Taggle Gordon Day. Yay! I messed up that one time, but I made up for it. All right. It's a national holiday in the Philippines honoring James Leonard Taggle Gordon, <laughs> who serves as mayor of Alangapo City from December 30th, 1963 to February 20th, 1969 and was the country's first mayor to do so. He was born on January 17th, 1917, to Filipino mother mother Veronica Tagle Ibella and American Marine father John Jacob Gordon. Oh, so he had an American father, and his mother was Filipino. He chose to remain in the Philippines as a Filipino citizen, building his life and raising his children as Filipino citizens, even though his four brothers obtained American citizenship and resided there. I mean, I think that was probably a smart thing because, well, if he was born in 1917, I was going to say that, me, you know, he, he probably was trying just to avoid the war. He was like, I think I'm good. I'm going to stay. There's a world war happening, so I'm just going to stay here and just avoid it. Or, or maybe he just, like, really loved the Philippine life. Um, so he, yeah, so they, they made a day for him. Oh, what? Oh, no. He was, he was murdered when he was an oh what when he was that's sad on february 20th 1967 in a conversation with a conversation with a constituent on the first floor of the city hall gordon was gunned down by nanito alencastre an escaped inmate of the national penitentiary whoa wow wow that's crazy he was assassinated that's really sad. And so then they made him made a day for him. Wow. Okay. Well, happy James and Leonard Tackle Gordon Day. He tried to do some stuff and he probably did it for a little bit, but then oh, that's very sad. Well, picking that up. Our other holiday today is a judgment day. Wow, that's a very stern man in that mirror over there. <laughs> um but we have our next sketch for this. And without further ado, Judgment Day. Repent! Repent! The end is near! Judgment Day is upon us! Okay, how do you know the end is near? Well, just look around you. Look at the world news. All of this strife and conflict everywhere. Okay, there's bad stuff happening, yeah, but generally international conflict has been on the decline for the past couple decades. Yeah. And that was before World War One. That was really bad. Or World War Two. Oh, that was even worse. And look, we're still here. You, well, what about the pandemic, huh? Okay, that was bad, and we didn't always handle it so well, but, you know, humanity has survived worse. What about the Black Death? Or the Spanish flu? Did- Environmental degradation! Overpopulation! Okay, we have our challenges, but you know, generally, the, um, the predictions about the Earth's carrying capacity up till this point have been wrong. We're still here. You know, maybe you should try focusing on having a positive outlook. You know, instead of thinking about the end of the world, why don't you just focus on making the world a much better place? That just makes sense. Hmm. You're right. But what about the Full House reboot, where the Olsen twins are exotic dancers? Really? That's a real thing. I saw it on TMZ! Yeah. Yeah, congrats. <laughs> So that was written by Doug McDowell, and that was starring myself, Jennifer Callison, and Morgan Elgarton. And that was really, really fun. We filmed that in Winter Park, which has a really nice park right by the Winter Park Library, and uh, where we also shot the Wikipedia Day. Um, it's a really cool little area. All these, like, there's like a little river, there's a little pond. It's, it's very cool. It's very pleasant. 
So for, to, to do the end of the world. <laughs> uh, but yeah, so that, those are our two sketches for today. Judgment Day and Customer Service Day. So pretty, pretty fun ones. All right. Now let's dive into learning with Judgment Day, which is actually different uh, than, than the Judgment Day that like we covered in that sketch. So uh, which I always love taking a nice fun spin on things. Judgment Day takes place on January 17th every year. Even though it sounds serious, it's a fun holiday that reminds us that we are our own best judges and we don't have to wait until death to realize our rights and wrongs. All you have to do on Judgment Day is simply take a glance in the mirror and be your own judge. I mean, who? Did, I kind of do that every day. I look in the mirror. I'm like, how do I look? Mm, mm, maybe I shouldn't have eaten that like cake yesterday or whatever. <laughs> But anyway, um, <laughs> the, uh, the day is often summed up in a single quote. Now you don't have to see how you die. You know, you don't have to die. Just now you don't have to see how you die. <laughs> I don't think you can. Um, now, you don't have to, now you don't have to die to see how you measure up to your deity standards. Just look in the mirror, wait for the answer, and go out and give another shot. Judgment Day reminds us to be kind and do good even though no one is watching. Even when no one is watching. So you just like stare at yourself in the mirror and then you're like, am I a good person? Am I a bad person? Am I a complicated person? So just stare at yourself in the mirror, just like this guy here. And then once you get the answer, um, go out and do better because most likely your answer is you're not a good person. No, I mean, there are a lot of great people out there, but we always have room for improvement. You can always make yourself a better person, and I think we should continually strive for that, especially in the world is is more and more crazy. So, yeah, judge yourself. Kid Inventors Day. What? Kid Inventors Day celebrates the creativity and ingenuity of young people all around the world. You would be surprised to know how so many of the things that we use every day have been made by kid inventors. Kids have invented all sorts of the things that we use every day, um, all sorts of, of things that become common fixtures in our life. This includes earmuffs, popsicles, trampolines, Braille. I'm, I'm pretty sure I know the history of the guy that did Braille, and I thought he was much older when he created Braille, but whatever. And even the television invented... Hmm? I'm going to like investigate this in the thing. Anyway, Kids Adventures Day in particular celebrates the extraordinary life of Benjamin Franklin. Oh, one of the earliest known kid inventors. He invented swim flippers at the mere age of 12. Wow. When I was in, when I was in elementary school, we had um, an inventors. Uh, it was like an, inv it was an inventors like competition where we would all like invent things. And I remember like winning a couple things sometimes um, some of the years when I was a kid. I like, I remember I, I invented, invented like a, a reading light to like attach to a book, which they ended up coming out with that. So who knows if they stole my designs, but whatever. Um, just lots of really fun things. And it was, um, it was a whole competition thing and each grade entered it. And then they had like kind of like a science fair and it was for specifically inventions. And that was really cool. I don't know if they're still doing that, um, uh, but that was, that was pretty dope. All right. Let's just learn a little bit more about inventing. Okay, um, I want to know more. How did the popsicle get invented by a kid? I need to know more of these things. Um, oh, swimming flippers. So Benjamin Franklin invents swimming flippers at the age of 12. Louis Braille, who was blinded at the age of three, invents the system in 1824. So maybe he was a little bit, maybe he was a teenager when he did that. Because I remember, because he like goes to school and stuff too. Um. I thought he was an adult when he did that, but maybe he was a kid. Wow. Popsicles. Frank Epperson invents popsicles at the age of 11. Very cool. And George Neeson and Larry Griswold invent the first trampoline in 1935, I guess, when they're kids as well, which makes sense. You have a bunch of kids that are just like screwing around and they're like, let's just jump on this thing and make it bounce. And they're like, yeah. And thus the trampoline was made. Very cool. Okay. National Bootleggers Day. Ooh. Or maybe they're making that that hot buttered rum. Yeah. The National Bootleggers Day is celebrated on January 17th every year to mark several key events. The start of Prohibition in the U.S., the uh, distillation of Templeton Rye whiskey, 
and the birthday of the famous gangster Al Capone. Mm, that's weird. Um, what's interesting is how all three events are interconnected too. It was the onset of prohibition that prompted both Capone and farmers in Templeton, Iowa to distill their own whiskey to sell. This is how the famous Templeton rye whiskey was born and its popularity spread like wildfire through during prohibition so much that it became Al Capone's favorite whiskey. So we're kind of just, you know, celebrating this one particular whiskey. Very interesting. Um, the term bootlegger itself has origins in Midwest America during the 1880s um, where well, Specifically, white folk, that's what they say here, would often conceal flasks of liquor in their boots when engaging in illegal liquor trade with Native Americans. And this nifty method of hiding liquor in boots. Oh, they were like trying to like sell liquor to the Native Americans and they're hiding them in their boots. Okay. Was, uh, was also utilized by the military too. You put a lot of stuff in your boots. Boots were big back then. They were. They were big boots. Um... Thus, the term came to be used for any smuggler of liquid. Uh, soldiers would often sneak alcohol into base camp by hiding the flasks in their boots. Um, the term came to be used for any smuggler of liquor who sm smuggled booze over land. Those who smuggled alcohol via water were referred to as rum runners. Ooh, rum runners. So if you were, so you were a bootlegger if you were on land, but if you were overseas, a rum runner, which sounds very fun. That buttered rum. Hot buttered rum. <laughs> anyway, uh, so this became a holiday in 2015. Um, oh, wait. Oh, yeah. There was like a thing where it took a long time. Um, so it wasn't in two 2006 that Templeton Rye was legally stocked. Um, it took a long time. I think there was like some outstanding uh, type of thing that's going on. But anyway. Oh, where is that? Why are they not talking about that? Anyway, that's fascinating. But then in 2015, National Bootleggers Day is founded. So get yourself some whiskey. All right. Oh, National Carolina Day for all those people that are named Carolina. And every person who has ever named, uh, to commemorate the name Carolina and everyone who is ever named Carolina um, or Carolina. It's particularly a feminine name and has origins in the Spanish, English, Italian, Portuguese, Catalan, Swedish, and German languages. The name Carolina in German means a free or a beautiful woman. However, in um, Latin, Carolus, Charles, was the name Carolina is derived from, which generally means free man or freeholder. Okay, so free, beautiful, all that. Um, Carolina can also mean a song of happiness or joy in French or the prettiest woman of the town in Spanish. All right, so happy National Carolina or Carolina Day to all of you out there. And then we also have National Charlotte Day um, to celebrate Charlotte in the world and the uniqueness of an existence. The uh, name Charlotte is primarily female and is believed to be of French and English origin. The meaning of Charlotte is free. So another name which means free. Charlotte is the feminine form of Charles and is often named Charlie or Char Charlie. There are many other common nicknames for Charlotte, including Lottie, Lotta, Char, and Carlotta, an Italian form of Charlotte. And we all know about the most famous Charlotte, Charlotte's Web. You thought I was going to say Sex in the City, but no, but no, Charlotte's Web. Yeah. All right. Oh, we already did National Hot Buttered Rum Day. Woo woo. National Hotheads Chili Day. Oh, on this day, chili heads, heat seekers, and extreme eaters try out the spiciest chilies. National Hotheads Chili Day is celebrated with habanero eating challenges, fancy dress contests, and cook-offs of popular recipes. Uh, chilies are also made to take the official Scoville heat scale. That doesn't mean that you have to be a daredevil to celebrate the day. Anyone who likes their meal a little hot can celebrate the day. All right. Very cool. So we had yes, we had the the we had the chili hot and spicy day, and then we have you know this national hotheads chili day. So have some spices, have some chilies. National Ta Day. This is a oh, okay. This is another name day. Let's appreciate all the people called Ta over the world. It's a common last name found in Vietnam among the Chinese community. This name is a transliteration of a Chinese surname which means to thank, apologize, wither, and decline. Ooh. Huh? I'm sorry, wait. So you're like, 
I thank you. I'm sorry. I wither and decline. What does that mean? Wow. That's a strange name. Uh, most of the Ta's who left China and have settled down overseas in the last 400 years most likely came from Guangdong and Fujian provinces. Uh, that's really strange. Um, as our Chinese, it, it, ch it basically turned into thank. That's the main part. But that whole like wither and decline sounds a little extreme. So, all right. Uh, Popeye Day. Popeye. Yeah, Popeye. Popeye the Sailor Man. I live in did it, boo boo. I'm Popeye the Sailor Man. I remember watching that cartoon when I was a kid and I loved it. And I think they probably made an update of it. But I, I remember watch I think I remember watching the old ones. And then also at um Universal, there's the Popeye um the the like rapids that you ride. And um there was so I have a story about this. So Alex and I went with his mom like last summer like last summer not not two summers ago she came and she visited us and it was a particularly chilly day it was like the, i don't know why it was just a little chilly um maybe it was spring it was sometime but she came and she visited us and we went to the popeye barges which was you know the and and so you get soaked on this ride throughout you know you pretty much not a single person doesn't get soaked but we're going up this incline and all of a sudden the ride like just pauses and we're stuck on this ride at the exact same time, this water, this rampant water stream is literally soaking her and it's freezing and we're stuck and you're on an incline. So you can't get out of your seat because you're afraid if you get out, you probably will like fall and, and tumble away. I swear it was like five minutes that she was like, we were stuck on this ride and she's screaming and we're just like cracking up because it was, it was that Schreiden front where you're just like, oh my God, this is terrible. And just this, like the ride there, there, I don't know what was happening, but there, there was some type of technical glitch and we were stuck on this incline and she was getting soaked with this freezing water and it was absolutely awful. And every time now I think of Popeye and I think of that ride, I just think of her and like the whole time her face was literally like, why is this happening to me? It was like, for those of you that are watching along, that was I, I made I made a very like why is this happening face, but yeah. So that that that's a very interesting that's a, that's a story I have to tell about Popeye <laughs> that's close to my heart. But anyway, let's learn about the comic. So uh, on uh, Popeye made his debut performance in a appearance in a comic strip called Thimble Theater. Uh, Elsie Chrysler E C Cigar created it on January seventeenth, nineteen twenty nine. Wow. So this is almost 100 years old. The uh, The comic was originally centered around olive oil. Ooh. But the popularity of Popeye changed that? What? It was about olive oil? And then they were like, nah, Popeye's cooler, so we're going to change it to that. I mean, he is he's cooler. Olive oil is a little, like, wimpy. I mean, they should have just had her eat the spinach. But I guess it was the 20s, you know. Anyway, by, uh, by 1933, Popeye had his own cartoon series, I Am What I Am, <laughs> which is the first cartoon with Popeye as the main character. Fleischer Studios released the cartoon between 1933 and 1942. Even after a century, Popeye remains one of the most popular comics ever produced. Yes. Wow. Fa fascinating. Um, very, very neat. Uh, so, yeah. So, so uh, read yourself some cartoons or watch some Popeye cartoons or go to Universal if you're in the area, but be very careful about that ride. <laughs> you will get soaked. And honestly, it's a cold, it's cold right now. I would not go on that ride right now if you're in Florida. Not unless you're like from Alaska and you're like, oh, it's great weather. It's freezing. Don't go on that ride unless it's like July. And then, cause you're just going to get soaked and then you're going to feel soaked the whole day. Oh, Okay. So moving on, we got a uh, printing ink day. Printing ink, ink day. Um, it's celebrated annually on the closest Tuesday to January 16th since 1977. It's a day we can all come together to remember one of our most essential office tools. We get to know what inks are made of, where they come from, and what they are used for. 
Ink is generally a colorant, such as a pigment dot or dye used to deliver color to a surface like paper. Back in the day, there were no printers or ball pens to take notes, so people used materials like colored vegetables or blood of fish. Oh, what? Blood of fish? They're like, excuse me, I gotta take a note. Let me just murder this fish and then write in its blood. Ugh, that's gross. And that smell too. Ew. That's probably smelled the worst notes ever. Anyway, imagine having to kill a fish every time you need to send a note to a friend. Well, maybe you ate it afterwards? You had some, like, fish afterwards? But that's disgusting. Ew. Um, uh, ink has been around for a long time. The first man-made ink was most likely de developed in Egypt over 4,500 years ago. It was formulated by mixing carbon suspensions in water with additives like egg albumin and natural gums to hold it together. Wow. Later on in, uh, in 2500 BC, the Chinese and Egyptians simultaneously developed inks made from similar materials. Soot derived from wood smoke and animal fat and condensed with a substance from animal skin called gelatin. Wow. So lots of things. Around 400 BC, Indians inv developed their ink called masi from burnt bones. Tar, pitch, and like our modern day pens, a needle was used to apply the ink to parchments. So you're saying like when you look at all those parchments and stuff back in the day, especially particularly from India, there's like they're made of burnt bones. Ew. Wow. In 1440, the mechanical printing press was invented by Johannes Gutenberg, but it had a unique problem. Existing ink did not absorb fast enough into the paper and inconveniently smudged as the press moved. To find a solution to this problem, Gutenberg came up with the first oil-based ink made from turpentine, walnut, oil, and soot. All right, and earned him the father of prince. Yeah, so thank goodness Gutenberg was like, we're not gonna like make these bones and the weird fish blood stuff and animal stuff. Let's just make it not, not with animals. How about that? How about that? That sounds great. Um, in 1772, the first patent was issued in England for making colored ink. And as the millennia advanced, new print technology developed. In the 1970s, there was an oil crisis and printers started look, oh yeah, and all like the, the cars were like backed up and like, I, I hear my parents, you know, they, they, they talked about the thing where, you know, you had alternate days that you could go, like even uh, license plates versus odd license plates, you know, that huge oil crisis. So printers started then looking at as an alternative to petroleum based inks. Um, such as water, soy, and vegetable-based ink, which are more sustainable and friendlier to our environment anyway. Yeah. So, printing ink day is first observed on, in 1977 as well. They are probably, like, just trying to be like, hey, this new ink, why don't you go buy it? Yeah. I think printing ink is pretty expensive. It's gotten way more expensive over the years. It's so expensive. But I have, I have, a, I have a printer that it's, like, um, it's like tanks, and so you just throw like these tanks of ink in it, which I have to say, like I haven't had to change it once and I've had it since last year and we print a bunch of scripts. We print lots of other things. So I have to say, but it takes forever to print too. It's the slowest freaking printer in the world. It prints like one page, like every minute. I swear it's so slow and it drives me insane. And there's no way, even if you do draft, but the ink is really, really cheap. So I mean, you can't, you can't, you can't argue that. <laughs> Rid the world of fad diets and gimmicks day. Ooh. Um, celebrated every Tuesday after the third Sunday in January, which starts Healthy Weight, weight Week. Um, this year it takes place on January 17th. It seeks to promote weight management and encourage people to eat healthily and have a balanced diet. Weight management includes specific techniques and physiological processes that enable one to attain and maintain a certain body weight. Most of these techniques comprise long-term lifestyle strategies that promote healthy eating as well as daily physical activity. It involves developing meaningful ways to monitor one's weight over time. Yeah, so like lose weight healthily. Don't just like throw some weird gimmick at it because most likely it won't last and it might be not good for you. So just eat healthy and exercise. That's the best thing that you can really do. So yeah, very cool. Oh, what? St. Catherine died from extreme fasting in 1380. St. Catherine of Siena resorts to extreme fasting to avoid marriage. So that's different. It wasn't like she was trying to lose weight. She just didn't want to get married. 
She was like, I'm not getting married. I'm going to fast. And they're like, we're going to call your bluff. And then she just died. Wow. Wow. That's, that's sad. Poor St. Catherine. She just didn't want to get married. And they just didn't want to. And then she was like, I'm not going to eat. Wow. The first book on dieting was in 1558, though. So that's cool. All right. All right. Here we go. We got all the birthdays. Ooh, lots of birthdays here. I'm just going to. I'm just going to gloss over. There's a lot of birthdays here. Um, some of them are sad because Betty White is no longer alive. As I always find it strange when people celebrate birthdays for people who are not so alive. But we pretty much know most of these people whose birthdays they are. Um, Muhammad Ali is not so alive as well. So, But all right, without further ado, our happy birthday song. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Michelle Obama, Betty White, Dwayne Reed, Eartha Kitt, FKA Twigs, Jake Paul, James, James Earl Jones, Jeremiah Raber, Jim Carrey, Kid Rock, Mari Povich, Muhammad Ali, Ray J, Sarah Molina, Skate Maloli, Steve Harvey, Zoe Deschanel, Happy birthday to you. Yeah. So we, mo- we know most of those people. The other ones are probably just, you know, YouTubers again, which... Uh, whatever. Whatever. Although I do say I'd, I would like to have my birthday celebrated one day, too, on this nationaltoday.com. Anyway. That's our show. I'm Kimberly DePersia. This is the National Holiday, the Holidays Podcast. We are here every morning, 7 a.m.-ish, during the weekdays, a little later on the weekend. If you are following, please give us a like, hit that notification bell, subscribe wherever you're watching, so you can be on the alert every time we go live again. You can also watch all of these on nbpictures.com or our NB app, which is available on all Apple devices. Only $40 a year. And you get all of this, as well as um, award-winning films, series, short films, lots of stuff, more podcasts. So check it out. 